Hey there Together Learners, Eric back again. So when we do our teaching and learning online, we have a whole suite of tools, ideas, technologies at our disposal. And one of the most well-known, most well-established, most trusted and true methods is print. And this could mean a whole new kind of variety of ways and modalities now that we're using different means to convey text, not just print material. So in this video, we're going to talk about text and print, the design of it, how it's used and utilized and the upsides and downsides of using it in different modalities for your online learning. You can basically think of it as the beginning, the fundamental steps in starting to understand technology and use. So it's really critical, I think, that we understand print, books, text, and how it goes into the design of teaching and learning because everything that comes after it, even things like these days on this channel I talk about virtual and augmented reality, still use text and print and books to supplement this kind of journey, these skills that we use moving forward from uh, singing and acting, to video, to audio recordings, and now virtual and augmented reality. We can even see this in some of the latest VR environments where we're still using an antiquated QWERTY layout keyboard and text with flat screens in these immersive 3D environments. And so we're going to talk about all that and how that relates to the design of learning, the design of distance curriculum and relate that hopefully to where it's taking us in the future in this video coming right up all right so print technology the printing press uh i even made a game way back in the day talking about ancient scrolls and how that changed how we view information and teaching and learning and being able to preserve information in ways that we couldn't have before. This is an elemental focus on educational technology. So it's good to get your head on it. It might seem antiquated. It might seem a little actually kind of boring uh, if you're a, a technologist like myself to think about books and print and text but we use it in almost every form after that. So print is the foundation of distance education, the foundation of educational technology, because it allows us from very long ago to get our teachings, to get our information in ways that allows a whole new paradigm, almost like time travel, for that information to be preserved and presented in different ways. So it's the basis from which all other deli delivery systems of teaching and learning evolved. This is the, the amoeba <laughs> of uh, learning technology. So it's good to get a, a, a well-rounded understanding of print, of text, and how it's used in different contexts. Because now, not only can we think about the first scrolls way back in the day, uh, but now we can relate it to how we're using and utilizing text and books in new environments, such as the one I talked about in the first part of this video, where we're actually still using text and books in digital form in virtual environments when we can actually, instead of, for example, um, transporting you to a Shakespearean uh, theater and watching the play, you still might read it on a screen in a virtual environment. It's very interesting how that kind of plays out can see it in almost every facet of evolution in technology and teaching and learning. We seem to use it as we had used it before. Um, I'm going to put a link to this particular game that I created to help us understand this aspect. You're going to take an adventure and go back in time to ancient Egypt and tour the Library of Alexandria just before it gets burnt down to see what people are saying about the technology of scrolls, being able to write things down and save information for long periods of time. Right, so if we talk about a bunch of different ideas around this, we can talk about, firstly, what is the advantage of print? Uh, why would we want to hand out a piece of paper with print on it or make students buy a textbook rather than 
um, making them, giving them a, a PDF file, for example. Well, first of all, it's low tech. Um, you can hand something, you can ship something, uh, you can get a book or a text to any, pretty much anywhere in the world, just shipping to them. They don't need internet access. They just need access to it and to use it to, to have it be sent back and forth. You don't even need, for example, um, processing power. Sometimes you don't even need electricity and you can use a text to convey teaching and learning. But low tech is not just in book form, but it's also when we're thinking about something called universal design. So when we want to give technology, we want to convey information, even over distance learning through the internet, text is some of the most accessible forms of information that we can possibly offer to students, right? A text file can be opened by almost any computing device, any platform, uh, even like phones that are 10, 20 years old can open up a text file and look at the information on it. We have PDFs now that are universal and can be viewed uh, as a text document, no matter what and how you're viewing it on any platform or system or place on the internet or browser or whatever. So it becomes low tech. And because it's low tech, well, in essence, PDF, sometimes in the way you look at it, it could be high tech in the way you think of it. But anyway, the low tech is sometimes equated to accessibility and the ubiquity of being able to use it. All right, next we have transparency, right? Um, text is what it is. Um, there's no algorithm behind a book. Perhaps when it got put to you in front of you on Amazon, there is, but as you're looking at a text, you're transparent as in what data is available and what is trying to be conveyed to you through this information, through this technology. If you're using a VR environment or a game-based environment or maybe even some sort of branching uh, web-based tool, it's not necessarily clear to you all the information that might be available or could be available uh, to you as you progress through the system. Some information, even in some learning management systems are locked behind logins or paywalls or um, access um, systems that allow certain groups of students or certain um, kind of moderation techniques to make the learning, make the content a little more opaque. Non-threatening, um, the technology is so ubiquitous and it's been around for so long having a book laying around having a couple of papers laying around is not intimidating by any means uh, at least that's what it's thought by by a lot of educators especially uh when reading edu around about educational technologists in uh, the previous generations uh no onboarding, right? So when we are using new technology tools, especially in distance learning, there usually is a period of onboarding, of acclimating students to particular platforms, how it's used, where do you click, how do you log in, things like that. Print kind of eliminates all of that and allows you to start reading and absorbing information uh, quickly. Of course, it's cost effective. Uh, we could argue that large amounts of print may not be as sustainable or ecological friendly as sending out a electronic copy. It depends on how many copies you're sending and where you're sending them to or having print them out. And it's editable and revisable, much different than later forms of, of media like video or VR environments where it takes more effort, maybe even reshoots or reprogramming to uh, reevaluate and revise contents. Of course, once, once it's printed on the page, you'll have to reprint it too, of course. All right, so here's some examples of print. And then now I'm putting this also up to text because as we equate this to distance learning, print is usually not equated to something on paper. It's usually text driven through any system 
that you may be using for your distance learning. This could be a website or a learning management system or even text on the wall of a virtual environment. We still use text everywhere. We use it to put subtitles on our videos and uh, give PDF handouts that go along with video presentations like the one I'm giving now. So we have textbooks. They can come in all types of forms as in PDFs, printed books, uh, e-books, and virtual environments that we actually are in the textbook and reading screens in virtual environments. But there's all these different kind of supplementary materials. And this is kind of the trend that we're looking at now in not only educational design, but web design and um, the use of and the the trends of actually communicating using more media rich systems like video pictures and and uh, 3d environments so we often now you see this as a trend is where you show a video or you put somebody in a 3d environment or a game-based sort of simulation but then you have kind of supplementary text that allows and puts context to whatever more media rich thing that you've just viewed. I do this a lot with my courses that I design online. I might have a video lecture like I'm doing now, but I also put down the main points and maybe some nuanced things that go around what I'm saying in the, the video in text form. And that could be in the, in the, the form of a study guide or aid before you watch a video, before you do a simulation, worksheets for after you do it to review and see what you've thought, do a little reflection. Um, we're also using this a lot for printed um, sort of logistics of our online learning. So schedules, uh, policies, and have that in print somewhere because this happens a lot, right? Uh, that's why we have to read the, fri the fine print, and that's still a saying that we see, right? If you want something that's transparent and able to be viewed and understand easily and often by your students, so these go along with the policies of your classroom, how you'll be graded, um, the due dates, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we use things like a syllabus in print form, and you won't see it so often in video form case studies and now we're even using subtitles uh as a form of text you know uh, uh, not just what we're saying but adding extra graphics on screen text uh, we see this a lot in TikTok videos where um, you are not only putting the words that are coming out of somebody's mouth but you're also annotating that and curating that information with extra text that you see on the screen so it's kind of multimodal in its approach. So these are some examples that you see around text, not just print, right? So when we think about designing text or printed material, there's a couple of considerations that you want, want to come down on. And a lot of this comes down to the mode from which you'll be delivering your text or printed material. So things like graphic design, the formatting of the text or the, you know, the, um, the arrangement of the text and how it is, how it fits on the page. So it also is very closely connected to the placement of it and the white space that's around it. A lot of connected to graphic design, right? The topography, the font used, the sizes of the font, how often do you bold and the colors being used. A lot of this also is now being sought at even more closely after we started making websites for our materials and less on the printed books. And also now that we have PDFs, we're able to not have to be limited by uh, using color ink or large amounts of paper. We see a lot more white space. We see a lot more blank pages. We see a lot more pages with only a couple of graphics or fewer words and more, maybe even adding things like video and things to it. Because we're thinking more of a web designer, a graphic designer, and less of a, a wordsmith, uh, for example, in many of the ways that we put our text together, if, especially if we're thinking about uh, putting them in an online format. So text can be just plain text. If it's being designed in a way to be accessible, uh, you're, not, you're going to actually make it accessible to prep, perhaps a screen reader uh, this is happening a lot these days when you design it in, in 
coming back to universal design, somebody that has a hard time reading, somebody that has a hard time with the language, having that text in machine readable text on your website or in your uh, PDF, you have to have that text, the, the, the file actually be set up security wise, not to um, conceal the actual text information and be have it available for copy and pasting, for example. So a machine can read it to someone or blow it up and make it bigger for somebody, et cetera, et cetera. So print is very, goes a long way for accessibility for your online learning as well. And this goes a long way in helping you inform how you'll design it for your students. All right, some very simple do's and don'ts when you're putting print together. So this is not universal. It depends on, of course, the context of your content and the, the audience and the students that are looking at your content. But in, in simple terms, when you write a text, you want to make it short instead of long to the point, right? Um, text, in the, the, at least the trend is anyway, that I'm seeing is um, text used to be long and nuanced and give you a lot of information, a well-rounded um, point of view. Now learning is moving more towards video to get the point across quickly as possible and then using text to highlight the main points to give you a different way of looking at that idea or concept in written form so you can uh, understand it easily. So shorter instead of longer. Uh, the wording is simple. The sentences are shorter and less complex and you're using more commonly used words and less technical jargon or um, difficult vocabulary. Uh, depends again on your audience. So when I'm trying to get across complicated systems or complicated uh, concepts, in uh, some higher learning classes that I teach, I often have to revert to uh, technical terms or um, some advanced vocabulary because that allows you to feel a little bit of the nuance because we have to choose our words more carefully in situations like that. But again, when you're designing it for it, for it to be read, you want it to be universally brought up. And this also, when you keep it short, simple, and use common words, it's able to go back on that universal design and, for example, it better works with machine translation if you have a student that's weak, perhaps in English, and translating that into their mother tongue or having an on-screen reader read things. Uh, it's read more clearly understood when you follow these simple um, design principles. All right, so an interesting thing to think about now is um, a physical books versus printed or digital books or ebooks, right? Ebooks are all the rage. We're using them in a lot of the classes I use. They're interactive in many times. They might give you a quiz or embed some video or other types of core media rich, more media richness uh, type of uh, things added to it. But we know through research that physical books somehow have an advantage in many ways in getting things into our brains, at least for our long-term memory. Now, this could be for a variety of different reasons, and a lot of the research papers try to point to different reasons. Uh, one thing that sticks out in my mind is just the, the mode from which we use technology. We are a crutch to it. For example, if I have my phone here, uh, ever since I had a smartphone, I don't remember phone numbers as much. I don't my brain doesn't seek to absorb phone numbers or email addresses as much or even addresses or how to get to places because I know I can rely on this for later. It becomes a crutch. So maybe it could be that we are transferring some of that modality, some of that way of thinking um, of using screens to how we absorb the printed words as we read them. So we know from several studies that we ha students are scoring worse if they're reading from a screen than a physical book or piece of paper. Now, this could be also related to the tactile version of it, um, but several studies have shown that if you read from a book or from a printed page rather than a screen, and then some of these studies are done with Kindle, some of them are done with websites, it doesn't really matter. Almost every one of these studies have found 
that printed material is absorbed, somehow absorbed a little better. Now, not just the, the way that our brains are absorbing it, but it also goes upon the user and how they can interact with that content, right? So skimming versus searching. So if you have a physical paper or a book, you're actually looking at the words, even though you may not be trying to get every word into your brain, you are still looking at that and you may be passively getting a rounded, more comprehensive view of the book because you're skimming through the papers trying to find a specific something information. You can skip that process entirely in a PDF, for example, by just searching for the thing that you want to find out, a keyword that you want to zoom in on and read around it. So instead of skimming, you're searching. And then instead of taking notes, which you might do if you're reading a book, you might have a separate paper, paper that's a whole different mental process that might help you in absorbing information as well. Uh, what we're doing many of the times in digital forms of text is we're annotating them, we're highlighting them, which is a whole different kind of modality as far as our brains go and connecting to it. So the, the, this, doesn't this doesn't completely explain why somehow we are absorbing information a little bit better. It also could be that um, we are just accepting of things that are printed in a physical form rather than digital because we feel like digital information is maybe less valuable because it's not actual a physical thing. Anyway, but for whatever reason and how we're using it, this can go into the design of how you're presenting your text to make it a little bit more possibly ab absorbing by your students. So again, let's go back to those principles I showed you earlier for short instead of long, simple instead of complex. Usually, if you can bend towards those uh, design principles will help with some of this. I think. Right. So coming down on it, I've had this idea of wordsmithing, right? So um, we're thinking about print and this is only one kind of aspect, one media type when thinking about designing e-learning, designing distance learning, designing educational technology tools. But the wordsmith is key here, right? The, the skill of putting words together in a way to put pictures in people's minds to explain something with clarity and easily understood is a key skill in designing and putting forth text, right? You can do those things that I said before, the design principles, but if you don't have the practiced skill of wordsmithing, of putting these words, arranging these words in a way that makes it clear to the reader's mind, uh, you'll have trouble using text, using books, using print for educational means, right? So this is a practice skill, which means all you have to do is write, 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 and have people read it, read it, read it, and you will, this hopefully will gain uh, potential and uh, skill up over time. All right, let's talk about where this is all going as far as moving towards the future. So print uh, and how we kind of engage with printed material. At the beginning of this video, I talked a little bit about how print is being used or how text is being used in virtual environments. So this is like the most advanced kind of environments that we're seeing right now in education and distance uh, learning is hopping into virtual worlds in a headset or augmented reality, but we're still seeing a lot of text. So it's our human interface that is changing with the text. The text is not going away. It's how we, uh, the human computer interface that's connecting you to that text, that is what's changing, right? So for example, way back in the day when we didn't even have keyboard, keyboards, we had these big machines, we used punch cards and those holes in these cards would then translate into text, perhaps somewhere in the computing process. Keyboards, we still use a QWERTY a keyboard because that was how old typewriters were were made and so all that technology is brought forward as we move forward in time so we still have that qwerty keyboard in virtual space we have the mouse mouse now that we can click around in in our virtual environments websites click on links that again change the modality you see how we're getting more empathic with this right empathic computing is the idea of your media being able to understand you and understand your 
wanting to interact with it in a more human way, right? A punch card, looking at a card and the holes in it doesn't mean much to a human, but thinking about what's happening in your brain is very, very much a human. And But right now, a computer doesn't really understand what's happening in your brain. We don't even completely understand what's happening in our brain. And things like emotion and our gestures and our voice are starting to be more ways we can input. And so we see this already in our way, in our relationship with text, right? So uh, we can click our mouse to easily edit text, but now we can actually talk to our machines and it will turn it into text for us, or it can read that text to us if we're not able to read it, or uh, put it into something like a podcast or a video form. So you can have that text, but automatically put into voice if you should show want it or need it. So you can have it read to you as you read it, uh, with voice. Gestures, this goes along in emotions, right? So this is more biometric data. So we're seeing, not quite seeing this quite just yet, but we see it more when we use text in virtual environments. For example, if you were using a screen with text on it and you're sitting down and you stand up in a virtual environment, that text might be transferred to the, a wall that's next to you because it knows where your physical body is in relation to the virtual environment. Therefore, the text needs to be seen or displayed to people around you in certain ways. So our gestures and how we can wave, you, like a minority report situation where we're just moving text around in our environments, physical environments, if we're thinking about augmented reality in this same way too. And all the way up to uh, understanding our thoughts. We're even getting into this where we can put, move a cursor on a screen or put letters onto a screen using um, a cap and understanding the, the uh, brain functions, the, the signals that are running around in our heads. So this is just, it's right now it's a little bit sci-fi, a little bit science fact, but we're moving in this direction. So our relationship with text is going to be changing as we get into these new systems moving forward. All right, this has been all about print material uh, for educational technology. I hope this was useful to you. We'll see you in the next video. We're probably gonna make some more videos about other types of media, for example, recordings or, or um, video uh, moving forward. I'm Eric, we'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye-bye now.